for that. It's time to get nostalgic for the Ryder Cup. Flashback to 20, 2006, I should say. First up, here's John Duggan and Today FM, live from the K-Club, as Europe were crowned Ryder Cup champions on this very soil. Live from the K-Club, good afternoon, I'm John Duggan. Europe have won golf's Ryder Cup for an unprecedented third successive time. They've done it on Irish soil, and not only that, they're going to annihilate the United States of America. Joining me with the details here in County Kildare is Conor Morris. Well, chasing a 10-6 overnight deficit, 45,000 people came to the Palmer course here at the K-Club today. Every single one of them expected a big American fight back. Well, it simply has not materialized. Instead, what we've all witnessed is a succession of heroic performances from each and every one of the European team on singles day. The winning stroke around 15 moments ago fell to the Swede Henrik Stenson. He sank a 10-footer for par on the 15th, and that wrapped up an emphatic 4-3 and win over the rookie Vaughn Taylor. Seconds later is Captain Ian Ian Woosnam was on hand to offer a warm hug and congratulations as the packed galleries already began the celebrations. Tiger Woods briefly reduced the gap to three points with a three and two win over Robert Carlson. Paul Casey sank a 25 footer for birdie on the 17th. That beat Jim Furyk two and one. David Howell holds four birdies in a row to beat Brett Wetterig five and four. And moments ago, Darren Clark burst into floods of tears after closing out a three and two win over Zach Johnson. Americans and Europeans in the crowd alike clapping and cheering the big John Gannaman. What a week it's been for him. Elsewhere, Paul McGinley still out on the course. He's all square with JJ Henry. Jose Maria Olafabel, their veteran, two up against Phil Mickelson. Lee Westwood, three up against Chris DeMarco. Potter Carrington, three down to Scott Verplank. Europe have won the Ryder Cup. It's been emphatic, comprehensive, and conclusive. Clark, Garcia, Westwood, Casey, just some of the heroes over the three unforgettable days here at the K Club. It's three in a row for Europe, and for the first time, they've won all five sessions. 16 points to eight as it stands and it's going to be even more promising than that. Well, Connor, it's the result every Irish sports fan hoped for. It's capped off an unbelievable week for everyone associated with the event. And what a victory for Captain Ian Woosnam and his players. Fantastic. Woosnam took a lot of stick coming into this tournament over selections, over the style of captaincy he was going to have. He's been vindicated in each and every one of his decisions from the pairings on the first day through the second day. His two wild cards have carried this team. Darren Clark and Lee Westwood, superb throughout. And if we just look up at the scoreboard, Darren Clark, a 3-2 and two winner. Henrik Stenson, Four and three. David Howell, five and four. Olathebal's two up. Westwood's three up. Luke Donald, a two and one winner. Paul Casey has played superbly all week. And as it stands, John, at the moment, we're leading by 16 points to eight. Two years ago in Michigan, it was a record margin of victory. Eight and a half, nine and a half. It's probably going to be exactly the same as that. It's been emphatic and conclusive. And there's going to be some party around Kildare, across Ireland, and throughout Europe tonight. <laughs> And 18 and a half to 9 and a half is exactly how it finished on that day. Happy memories. The great Conor Morris of Aerosport fame now. Yeah. Uh, of course, Conor was a commentator and presenter and uh, enjoyed working with them and with everybody else down there that week. Paul Collins as well was down there. And, uh, yeah, it was a, a, a magical week for Today FM. We, we had a studio by the lake. Oh, nice. Uh, so we saw Darren Clark's first tee shot and we saw Tiger Woods hit it into the lake on the first morning. And it was just... It just it felt so seismic and so big. Yeah, uh, I was at the Belfry four years before that on my own, but uh, that felt really like, whoa, this is a, a major event coming to Ireland, uh, and uh, hasn't been repeated since. And of course, we'll have the uh, Open Championship on the island of Ireland next year, but uh, that was uh, something else, and hopefully we get it back. Clark was amazing that week. Ah, uh, he was. Yeah, I think he po- he channeled really difficult emotions very positively. Uh, the, the, that tee shot was so difficult I'm sure for him and the, the roar when he hit it and he smoked it down the middle of the fairway yeah it was and of course he was celebrating them with a pint of Guinness I think on the balcony hour, about an hour after they won so yeah he, 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 was, uh, he was brilliant so what we often see I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the influencer game on Instagram but a lot of people do unboxings Paul Pog would do it does he? Uh, he, he probably does he probably does unboxings of his shoes and unpackings of I don't know what they do but Barcelona shirts you're going to become off the ball's very first influencer here because you're going to do an unpacking of the media kit given to you in 2006 at the K Club yes well I got a uh, Ryder Cup tie uh, so uh, very nice I don't think I've, I've only worn it about a handful of occasions so it's actually it's, there's no kind of curry stains or anything on it uh, Ryder Cup tie uh, I actually only found this Owen uh, I was doing a kind of a spring clean I found a Ryder Cup radio um, now I know people don't really use these kind of things anymore even though you should listen to the radio um, 
uh, yeah, so Ryder Cup Radio, and, and it's like in pristine condition. So, yeah, yeah. you can tune in uh, to the right frequency. Um, after Off the Ball AM is over. Of course. Um, so it's a Ryder Cup Radio, and uh, yeah, I've got this pack. Uh, so obviously you, you, you've got passes. I, I'm one of these anoraks that I keep my passes, you know, practice ground pass. I like to see players in the practice ground. Yeah. Uh, then the, 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 the mug shots, I call them the mug shots. This is the one from the Belfry from 2002. Definitely uh, would be a wanted man. 10,000 yeah. <laughs> 10, euro award uh, for this horrific mug shot uh, from 2002. A little bit less um, threatening uh, four years later uh, with to the Today FM for the, uh, the the K Club Ryder Cup. Uh, so yeah, you have the these kind of well, I don't know what these things are called, but um, lanyards, lanyards. Yeah, you keep them, uh, and and they they just had all these kind of quirky things that they gave you a Ryder Cup mouse mat. Wow, which I've never used, so I probably never will own. No, they're certainly um, gone out of fashion. Uh, they have, uh, yeah, and um, I know how to use a mouse these days. Um, <laughs> Uh, they had like things like you know the daily draw sheet uh, for the players. I'm sure all this has gone on. Nathan probably has all these and Joe in, in France right now. Spectator guide for the for the K Club, um, the official program of the event. Class. Uh, I'm not a programmist person, but it's nice to have that. Uh, and then like what I really enjoyed was stamps. You were given stamps. Right. Uh, so have you used them? No, I haven't used them. Um, you know of of of, of Irish golfers. Uh, you know you see their Patrick Harrington is is there. They've got. Um, you know the the balls of error and all that kind of thing and actually at the very back they've got ones that actually uh you know kind of i don't know if you can see it you can yeah. see the sand in the bunker and the ball moving in the bunker so um for all those time collectors yeah i don't know in maybe 50 years time they'll be worth billions of dollars i say they're worth a good bit already uh yeah well i haven't actually opened them since then so uh i'm just one of these weird anoraks when it comes to memorabilia and these kind of things and i keep everything um that i think is important so I, I don't have any balls. I've got a mug at home, but I don't, bizarrely, the one thing I don't have is a golf ball um, from the Ryder Cup in 2006. But I think when you have these events, like the Open next year on, on the island of Ireland or the Irish Open at La Hinch, you know, I'd be definitely collecting more things because to me, I, I remember somebody said to me once, well, you've got a box of tickets, so what? Uh, I, well, I've got a box of tickets that are just life experiences. Yeah. And I think that life experiences are what actually keeps us going. So the, the, the Cake Club was such a great week, and, and hopefully the Europeans will do it again in, in, in Paris. That's got to be your fondest Ryder Cup memory. Uh, yeah. I, I, I personally, what I experienced there, we, we, it was great that Today FM, we, we went down there for the week. Uh, we did all of our bulletins, our sports news down there for the week from the K Club, and we were really part of the. We did like bespoke shows. We did the Premier League live from down there on location, which was great. Uh, we we had Arnold Palmer on. Uh, we remember George Kimball, I mean, the great writer, yeah. America at large, who sadly passed away. So um, everybody was there. Everybody that you know you, you could speak to or would want to speak to was there. The last word was broadcast from there, and uh, and Ian Dempsey and everything. So. Um, I think for these things you need to embrace it and it's very rare and, and that's why even the, with the talk of Ireland playing World Cup games possibly in 2030, these things are so rare, they don't come around very often and that's no. why I kept everything because I, I do think it, it, it is actually a part of our history, our sporting history. What's your first Ryder Cup memory? Um, I think my first Ryder Cup memory is probably, uh, I remember seeing the Sam Torrance put from 85 when he had the pencil behind the ear, um, but I don't think I saw that live. So I think really the first one that I really got into was 87 when, okay. the, when the Europeans won for the first time in America. Tony Jacklin was a great captain, they won in Ohio. Um, but the first uh, Ryder Cup I really remember, I think you, you can be passively remember it, but then you can actively remember something. So I really remember the 1991 war on the shore. Uh, Good first one to remember. America had not won in eight years, um, and the Gulf War was on the time. And this was, I think, the first time we saw uh, the Americans uh, really buy into it because they did not like losing. I think Con Hulan once wrote that Americans don't like draws in sport. <laughs> they don't do draws because they can't cope with either winning or they have to win. Uh, and they weren't winning. Uh, and there was a huge pressure on the 25,000 people in South Carolina, the, the Key Island Ocean Course. Um, you had George Bush giving messages, the Gulf War was on, you had Corey Pavin wearing a camouflage cap. Um, and it was just was, it was so dramatic. You had Seve coughing uh, when uh, his uh, opponents were hitting tee shots, this kind of thing, gamesmanship. Uh, Nick Faldo didn't have the best of, of, of weeks. And um, it got down to the final day. Americans had a clear lead. Mark Alcovecchi completely choked lost the run of himself, hit, spraying his shots into the water, and it came down to Hale Irwin and Bernhard Langer. And Langer had a six-footer on the last for Europe, because if you draw in the Ryder Cup, 
you keep the trophy. Mm. So, like, if the United States draw against Europe this week, they keep the Ryder Cup. Um, Langer had that push to, to retain the trophy, and he missed it. And then he just you could see the agony in his body, sear through his body when he missed that putt. And you're just a young lad at home going, oh my God, we've, we've lost it. Yeah. Um, and then it, it, it changed then, I, and it, Brookline was a, was, a, was a great memory. 99. Yeah, yeah, because of just the, the, I think Brookline and Medina, because they were both in America and they both had a, a different uh, flip at the end. You had that uh, Justin Leonard put and, and everybody going mad when the United States won. Colin Montgomery was given an awful stick. Payne Stewart was great, very gracious to, uh, to uh, I think they were 10-6 down, uh, if I remember. Um, Europe, or, uh, well, what I know about that tournament is that Mark James put all of his best players at the end. He made a complete mistake. Yeah, they, yeah. it was kind of opposite, wasn't it? That the Americans, they, they, they obviously finished with their best players. The Europeans started. And 10-6 was the, the score for heading into the final round. Yeah, so he made a mistake that he put all the... Uh, um, the best players at the end, which was a was a fatal mistake, and uh, um, whereas whereas we saw in twenty twelve the miracle of Medina, I think Europe were ten six down, uh, and uh, they came through and, and and blitzed them in the singles, and you had Martin Keimer uh, winning with that winning, and then all Athabal's tears for Seve, so there was almost like a hidden hand there. But there've been some. I, I think what's what, the, the Ryder Cup has almost matured as because as a, as a golf fan and as a as a sports fan, you really felt that this was a real statement of uh, pride as a European because we had Seve, we had Sandy Lyle, Ian Woosnam, Nick Faldo around that time. Mm. Uh, and, and winning the Ryder Cup was such a seismic thing and that breakthrough and the war on the shore was such a, a battle. And, and then they won in 95 with Philip Walton had that winning put at Oak Hill. But by the time it got to the 2000s, Europe were winning, like in a, annihilating the United States twice. Yeah. 18 and a half to nine and a half in 2004, and then 2006 at the K-Club, 18 and a half to nine and a half. So you almost felt a degree of, a, a bit sated. Yeah. And you almost want the Americans then to win again. But well, the great the irony was that this was peak Tiger, and this was, also yeah. coincided with peak Europe in the Ryder Cup. And Tiger was and Phil Mickelson going out in the first morning in 2004, paired with Hal Sutton. They were so competitive at the time that they, they weren't that close. And you could see the tension on all, you know, they were, the pair of them were a mess. Mm. And Langer and Harring, uh, sorry, it was Langer at the captaincy. It was Harrington and uh, Montgomery that won that morning that set the tone for the whole. Montgomery has really made it uh, as a captain, uh, as a player, uh, uh, something that has been a real quest for him. But I felt as a, as a sports fan sated by those two wins in 04 and 06. And I didn't mind America winning it from time to time because there was a, a, a feeling there for a while that Europe were winning these all the time because they cared more about it, they had more spirit, and the Americans were just a bunch of, bunch of individuals put together for a week. Uh, but uh, as we saw in the last uh, tournament in Hazeltine, the Americans have got that unity and, and, and that sense of purpose, and they were blowout winners the last time. But what I think what happens with the Ryder Cup is the changing of the captains cannot be underestimated. To me, you know, I know that there's a kind of this kind of policy of rotation and giving everybody a chance, but a good captain necessarily won't be followed by a good captain. Mm. And I can see the influence of the captains positively and negatively on results. So that takes a little bit of the consistency away from the, from the events. And to me, it kind of lessens the event a little bit. Um, but as a European golf fan, I don't feel the need to prove myself or as, as a fan uh, to beat the Americans anymore because we've done it. Yeah, I do wonder how things changed after Brookline in 99 because I, w I wish I was old enough to actually kind of remember this in, in full flow because the way I see it, if you kind of chart history, the, the joy we get out of Europe winning the Ryder Cup is more to do with beating the USA than it is with this sort of continental glorification of success in a golf tournament. And I think 99 was the moment that we all looked at the Americans, you know, the, the invasion on was the, the 17th. 17th. Yes. Like, I mean... And uh, Sam Torrance saying that, Tom Lehman, you're not a man of God. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and he challenged him and then Tom um, profusely apologised and this kind of stuff. I've never seen something... like Because it went against, as we were speaking at the top of the show, against, against everything that golf is meant to be. Yeah, it's great. Which is this kind of gentlemanly, uh, you never cheat, the rules are, are, are very, very um, precise. Mm. Um, and sometimes I find when I when I when I go to a golf tournament that I just see these guys who are not short of um, uh, comfort, uh, a little bit in their own world in their own bubble. Whereas, so I think that the, the team nature um, brings out the visceral emotion of a young guy who used to be a guy playing against his mates 
for 50 bucks yeah. in college. And that is a good thing, I think, about the Ryder Cup. It brings the players a little bit more down to earth uh, in conjunction with the fans. And I think there's a good connection there. The thing is, as well, that the legacy of 99 was you go into 2002. And I don't know, I, I think when you look at sort of the, the cultural appropriation of the 2002 Ryder Cup, I think that's as big as it's ever got. Like Tony Blair talking about the Ryder Cup and saying, oh, well, what about the Ryder Cup? And he was talking about, I think he was at loggerheads with George Bush at the time about uh, in invasions in the Middle East or whatever. And this had suddenly be came up in, in the House of Commons, the, the, the Ryder Cup win. And I don't think we'll ever really get to that level again that the, the Ryder Cup's actually brought into like, the political sphere. Or maybe we just need kind of more golf fans in leadership around the world. Well, Donald Trump is a massive golf well, fan. You know, I'm sure he'll be tweeting about it this that. weekend. Yeah, because I wasn't there one of these, because um, you had so many anecdotes about Trump that, don't talk to me, I want to watch the Masters, uh, was one of the things I heard. Uh, so that, like, he definitely could tweet about it in the next few days, Donald Trump, uh, especially if the Americans win. I, I expect he would. Yeah. Um, uh, the 2002, there was a degree of solemnity uh, after the 9-11 attacks. Um, and Europe won it quite, quite easily. But I think the, the great leveller of the Ryder Cup is that, do you know who Philip Price is? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but would everybody on the street know who Philip Price is? Maybe not. Probably not, but is uh, that like a, a golf thing or is that a, a wider sporting thing? No, but I think most people on the street would know who Henrik Stenson might be. Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, I well, know, yeah, well, um, but Philip Price beat Phil Mickelson easily in the singles. So I think that there's a democracy, and I think that has a lot to do with the momentum, the team spirit, the chemistry, uh, and, and, and riding that wave. Uh, and that's why we see that the Americans have only won twice on this continent mm. since uh, Europe came into the competition in 1981 at Walton Heath and in 1993 at the Belfry. Yeah, we'll get into more memories in a little while, maybe go from 2004 onwards, 2004, like the, the idea of Woods and Mickelson being absolutely crap on that first day. We'll get into that. We'd love to hear your Ryder Cup memories as well. You tweet us at off the ball or come Thanks to, to screwfix.ie, championing the trade with a dedicated call centre.